Yes, indeed. Oh, we do praise him. Thank you guys so much. Pastor Tanya will be very happy when she sees you guys. You've done well. I asked him this morning, you know, um, it's very difficult uh, when you, the keyboard is kind of the, the basis for every, for, for which everything plays off of in our, with our praise team. And uh, it's very difficult without it. And I asked them this morning, I said, you guys, you know, you want us to put some videos of, <laughs> of you guys up? Uh, they said, well, uh, I think we can do it live. And I said, well, <laughs> all righty then, let's do it. And they did, and thank you guys. Uh, very, very good, so, so good for us. Thank you very much. All right, um, I wanna read for you uh, the opening paragraph of what I wrote on the handouts, and I know some of you get handouts, some of you don't. But, and, and you guys, uh, we get, have quite a few folks online that get the handouts. I, I plan, <laughs> and I'm saying that, I plan to continue to do that uh, for our Wednesday night meeting at, at home, at the house, for the message. Uh, I, I'm planning to do that, and so you guys that are online, you'll be getting your outline each week. Um, if you don't want to do that anymore, if you just let me know, I'll cut that thing off. If you do want it and you're listening and you're saying, what are you talking about? Uh, just send us, send in a, a, mes an, a message on Facebook or send in off of our website to the email address and we'll make sure you get one because there are quite a few people that get the outlines. And let me, let me just read you um, what, I, what I wrote to start with on this particular outline. And we're talking about, and I just titled it Judgment for Christians, like a question mark. Judgment for Christians? I mean, Christians are going to have a judgment? Well, this, at the essence of the Christian life, here's the writing. The essence of the Christian life is to consistently become more of what we should be and less of what we used to be. The result of this effort, this life, will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. It's called in the scripture the Bema, B-E-M-A, the Bema judgment seat. Paul talks about it in Romans 14, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, specifically saying that we shall all Christians stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the same judgment as the great white throne described in Revelation 20, where unsaved humanity receives final judgment for a life of rejection of the grace of of God. This is one of the three judgments of the last days. One of the judgments is a judgment called the sheep and the goats. And it's where the Lord judges nations on how these nations have responded to his people and the, the days in which uh, tribulation and horror and so forth are happening. And he puts the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. And, and it's a judgment uh, of the nations called the sheep and the goat. And then there is this Bema judgment, which happens at some point after we are raptured. When the Lord comes and gets us, he takes us immediately with him to heaven to be with him forever. The Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we will never again be separated from him once he comes and takes us home in, in these last days. Once we're there, there are a couple of things, I, I believe, that happen that are really, uh, the scripture talks about a great deal. However, it doesn't really pinpoint exactly when it happens. But I believe, based on the chronology of everything that, that is going on and follows, I believe that the judgment seat of Christ will happen almost immediately when we get to heaven. Because uh, we Christians have lived a life, and that life has produced fruit, or maybe even the lack of fruit. And our lives have followed us. Now, the judgment is at the end because 
I know you're aware of this, that when you die physically on this earth, you're not actually gone because everything that you have lived, everything that you have placed in the lives of others, every value or every obstacle, whatever it might have been that you lived and someone else picked up and learned and, and moved in their life because of that still lives on. And our lives are responsible for those things. And we receive rewards for those things that we have placed in the lives of others who have uh, lived faithfully and honored Christ and so forth. And then those things that we place in people's lives that weren't so good, uh, we suffer loss. And I'll, we'll read this in the scripture in a moment and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And then the great white throne judgment is at the very end of everything. It is at the end, it is when God himself sits on a great white throne, according to the book of Revelation, and the dead are brought before him. Now this is very specific. There will be no Christians standing before the great white throne of God. It says, and the dead were brought before him, great and small. And the books were open. And they were judged according to the things that were written in the books of works. What happened in their life? What did they do? How did they treat people? What was their life all about? And then it says, and the book of life was opened up. And when their name was not found written in the book of life, then they were cast into eternal darkness and judgment forever, which is created not really for them, but for the devil and his angels. And the reason why the judgment of lost people are at the very end is because like us as Christians, when someone dies on this earth that doesn't know the Lord, their works live on through their children, their grandchildren, their friends, their uh, acquaintances, their business partners, the people that they interacted with in life carry their philosophy, their mentality, their lack of concern or lostness or whatever it might be. So those are the three judgments that are mentioned at the end. Back when Pastor Tanya and I first started ministering in the service of the Lord, one of the things that we wanted to know was what is important? for us to do as in, our, in our life for the Lord. Because there are so many side roads, there are so many uh, false turns, there are, there's so much uh, carnality and humanity and pride and, 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 and everything that, uh, that betrays all of us in every area of life. Uh, they're, they're, the, the temptation is not different. The temptation is the same regardless of whether you're working in some secular world out here or you're working in ministry world. And I know that might sound surprising, but, but it's the same devil that moves to, to conquer all of us. So if you want to find out what it is you need to be focused on, the best place to do it, I think, would be to look at what God is going to hold us responsible for. Now, is there such a place in the scripture that tells us what ultimately God is going to hold us responsible for? Because if we can find that, then we can know, all right, this is what's important in life. This is what we need to pay attention to. And this is what the enemy is going to be attacking and early in ministry life, I was teaching through the book of 1 Corinthians and just going verse by verse in 1 Corinthians. And I came to chapter three and in chapter three, the chapter begins with the apostle Paul correcting some stinking thinking is what I call it in the book, in the church at Corinth. Now, just to let you know, the church at Corinth was a very, active, exciting church, but they had lots of problems. Matter of fact, most of what they did was a problem. 
And in chapter three, the apostle Paul says, all right, here's what's going on. Uh, you are split as a church because you can't decide who to follow. There are some of you in this church that want to follow Apollos, which is a, a very attractive young man, has a beautiful voice, has a great presence, a marvelous personality, and he's a fiery evangelist, winning souls and preaching Christ and just doing tremendous things. And many of you are very impressed with him and you say, we want Apollos. And then some of you want the Apostle Paul. And he said, there's a split and it's causing division among you just so that you can know what was thought about the Apostle Paul I thought you might find this interesting. I, you know, I've described him before, but uh, I didn't really give you any reference about that. But the only description of the Apostle Paul that's given is given in, with, by a second century pastor in, in, a, in a little book called The Acts of Paul. And it's a physical description of what Paul looked like and how he was. And, 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 and basically, he says, the Apostle Paul was a bald-headed, bow-legged, short man with a big nose and an unbroken eyebrow that lay across his forehead like a dead caterpillar. Now, that's a paraphrase. All right, here, let, let, me, let, me, let me give you the more literal translation, and this is the description of Paul. In Greek, it reads, a man of middling size, and his hair was scanty. That's a nice way to put that. And his legs were a little crooked, and his knees were far apart. He had large eyes, and his eyebrows met, and his nose was somewhat long. Versus the flaming, young, exciting, beautiful orator Apollos. Here's what the Corinthians thought about the Apostle Paul. We find it in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, and, and, and they said... Uh, Paul, you don't need to come see us as often as you do. You can just write us because your letters are weighty. They're, they're great. Your let, you are the best writer. In the, they are great. They challenge us. They're super. But when in, in person, you're really kind of a dud because you're not good looking and you really don't speak well. You kind of grate on people, Paul. So, just write us some letters. Don't worry about coming by all the time. And so to, in response to that kind of thinking and that kind of division that splits people over some personality or some beauty contest, the Apostle Paul writes the following. This is what follows that little discussion right there about you say Apollos, you say Paul. Yeah. Some say we're of Christ. And you're dividing the body of Christ. And here's what he says, beginning at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's literally cultivated field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid a foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, one side is gold, silver, precious stones, one side is wood, hay, stubble, you have a choice. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. It's gonna be revealed one day, capital day, big day, judgment day, Bama judgment, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. 
So this is the Bema judgment seat. Let's look at this judgment. What kind of judgment will this be and what will be judged at the, at the Bema judgment of Christ? First of all, no one will be there but Christians, and I've mentioned that to you, but you notice here he's talking about people who have built their life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He says there's no other foundation that will get you to heaven other than the foundation of Jesus Christ. Everything begins with the foundation. The foundation is the most important part of the building. You are God's building. You are God's cultivated field. So you can lay a foundation that is Jesus Christ, but then it, you have the choice of what you build on that foundation. So see, even though you're saved, you still have choices about what kind of life you live. And he said, you can live a life of gold, silver, and precious stones, or you can live a life of wood, hay, and stubble. And one of these days, there is going to come a day when the life you have lived is going to be revealed. And the fiery judgment of God is going to test your work. And it's going to reveal whether this work is gold, silver, and precious stones that endure the fire and remain or wood, hay, and stubble, which obviously get burned up in the fire, and you suffer loss. In other words, you receive no reward for that. But you yourself will be saved, yet so is through fire. I, I get the picture when he says that of someone who comes so close to hell that he can actually you actually smell like it, you know, the cinders. It's like you're headed right there. And God says, oh, no, you would have in stubble, but you had the foundation of Christ. Now, that's the grace of God that would do that, that would save you when you're so close simply because you've had the foundation of Jesus Christ. And I can't explain that, but that's what God is. He's so graceful. So what will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ because Something's going to be revealed and the day is going to expose our life. Well, the first thing I believe is our motives are going to be revealed. And I want, I want to go to the next chapter in chapter four and show you a couple of verses there in chapter four. And here they are, verses four and five. For I know nothing against myself. Well, you know, this shows that... Um, Paul's like the average Christian. Uh, but, hey, I don't know anything I'm doing wrong. I mean, really. For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. Just because I don't know anything that I'm doing wrong, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm justified by that. But he who judges me is the Lord. Listen, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light, now here it goes, the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart, then each, per, each one's praise will come from God. The, that word counsels, I don't want to get too technical about this, but you know, Greek words can sometimes not be carried fully by an English word. We just have such a poor language in many ways. The, words, the word counsels here is the Greek word boule, which simply means a deliberate act of the will secret motives. So our motives are going to be revealed. Uh, Paul says at the judgment seat, the first thing that'll be revealed is why did we do it? Why did we do what we did? I've been saved for 50 years, rough, yeah, 50 years now, saved when I was 16, I'm 66. Been, in the, been, been serving the Lord in, in church ministry for 48 years. And what I realize in my life is the most difficult task that we face as Christians is the refining of our motives. Because the line between divine commendation from God and human adoration 
is so thin that unless you're really careful, your motives can corrupt your service. Can a person do the right thing for the wrong reason? Sure you can. You can do the wrong thing for the right reason and it's just as bad, but you can do the right thing for the wrong reason and, it, and, it, and it's not godly. Uh, uh, James and John uh, in the scripture, two disciples, and not only them, but, uh, but others too, several times when Jesus is doing this tremendously great thing, you know, he's, uh, he's uh, walking on the water, he's feeding the 5,000, he's healing someone. And as they begin to leave the place and the disciples are walking ahead of Jesus, Jesus hears these guys arguing about something. You know what they're arguing about? Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? I am, James. No, I am. No, no, I, you know I'm the great. I mean, and they're arguing uh, not about uh, the demonic world, not about the lost in the life, not about what we're, we need to do that will better enhance the ministry, but arguing about who is going to have the top position in, the, in, in life. And when we see that in the scripture, we so easily condemn that. We say, man, those guys, can you believe that that's what they're concerned about? Which one of them is the greatest? When Jesus just did this wonderful work and, the, and, and he's here and he's doing, and they're arguing about, well, who's going to sit at his right hand and who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? So easy to see, but it's so difficult to see when it happens in our own life. This is why God says, my ways are not your ways and your ways are not my ways. And your thoughts are not my thoughts, and my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord, because it's so difficult for us to keep our motives clean. The second thing that's going to be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ are our methods. How we did what we did for the Lord. Some people say it doesn't matter what you do as long as, long as you just do something. But the Word of God indicates that it does matter how you do things. In 2 Timothy, look at it, chapter 2, these, two verses, these three verses. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, as a good soldier, you know what a good soldier, a good soldier is the one who can take order and not let his face move. Uh, I think I've said that years ago to you about letting your face move. It, it just means that when you're given something that's an order and, it, and, and you're thinking this is gonna cause a real hardship, no one can read your face and say, you know, that's a good soldier. Somebody that can, that can take the hardness and not let his face move. I pray a lot of times in situations, Lord, don't let my face move. Don't let my face move. And if you're an athlete, you don't, win the competition if you don't, uh, the old King James Version said, strive lawfully, p obey the rules. If you, years, several years ago, I guess it's maybe many years ago now, there was a lady in the, what was it, the Boston Marathon? You remember this? And this lady won the Boston Marathon. She was kind of a frumpy, middle-aged looking woman, no no, no offense, but she didn't look like an athlete is what I'm trying to get to. And she wasn't young, she, and she just came out of nowhere, Rosie something. She, she just came out of nowhere right at the end of the race and was declared the winner of the Boston Marathon, and she won it in a world record time. And they gave her the flowers, and they, they celebrated her, and every, the news media, and everybody. And then they went on to investigate and found out that she didn't appear at several checkpoints throughout the race. And the other people that were competing said, uh, we never saw her near us. Uh, 
We don't know where she came from. And it was found that she basically started the race, got in an automobile, drove to the end of the race, and then got out shortly before the pack was coming, got out into the street and ran ahead of them as if she won the race. Well, she didn't win the race. And her crown was taken away. And her, I mean, she's had a public embarrassment in life. So our, it does matter the way we do things. And especially in this world that we're living in now, uh, there, is, there, is, there is so much of life that is being challenged and being put forth as righteous or as good that we have to watch the way we do things. Not only must we do the right things, we must do the right things in the right way or else we're not, we're not, we don't receive the crown. Let me give you one other thing. Our management will be revealed. Now, I think this is really important and I'm gonna talk to you about this for just a minute. In 1 Corinthians 3, Verse 13, it says, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work. Now, here's the line of what sort it is. Now, aren't you glad that it doesn't say how long it is or how big it is or how masterful it is? It says the fire is going to judge our works of what sort it is. Now that's a blessed truth because that means the Lord is not going to evaluate me based on how long I have been with him or how much I have done, but he's going to base my evaluation on what did I do with what he gave me to do with. God is not going to judge you based on what he gave me to do with. And he's not going to judge me based on what he gave you to do with. Because we all have different talents. We all have different abilities. Uh, all have different lives. And so God is not going to judge us based on what everybody else has done. He's going to evaluate our life by what we did with what we have been given by him to do. And this is a great truth because uh, many of us aren't aware of what God has given us and we don't like where we are in the body of Christ. This body is made up of par all kinds of parts. Some of us our eyes, some are cheeks, some are ears, some are elbows, some are hands, some are knees. We all have different functions in the body of Christ. And, and God holds us responsible for functioning in, in, as that part is designed to function. And so, I see people many times in church that really don't like where they are in the body of Christ. I've told you that I feel like that I'm a big toe in the body of Christ. And I know that if you're a big toe, you have a tendency to feel like uh, I don't want to be a big toe because big toes live in places that are stinky, right, and, and hot, and they don't get a lot of uh, recognition like the other beautiful places like the hair or the rosy cheeks or the beautiful lips or the wonderful eyes that just get admired by everyone. Nobody has ever looked at you and said, you know, you've got the prettiest pair of big toes I believe I've ever seen. You've never been playing footsie with that person that you love and all of a sudden them look down and say, you know, I believe you've got the prettiest big toe that I have ever seen. You would look at him and say, take me home, please, would you? No, because toes are, that, that's, that is the one passage 
that I have trouble with in the scripture. Did I put it, did I put it on here? Did I put in a scripture next? Yeah, look at this. I just want you to see what it says. Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach unless they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Feet are just ugly, really. And how, <laughs> that's the only passage I have that has trouble. So if you're a big toe, and you're determined to be something else, like, I'm going to be an eye, because eyes are admired and they're beautiful. And you say to the Lord, Lord, I know you made me a big toe. And by the way, big toes are valuable because without it, you couldn't walk. You couldn't stand up. That's right, didn't be. You couldn't stand up. As a matter of fact, I had a woman one time, I was pastoring a church, and she was doing mission work and came into the city, and we had... Uh, a church van, and the church van was just like one of these uh, 15 passenger vans, and you had the side doors, and you get in and out. Well, when she was getting out and stepping down on the step, uh, somehow I, maybe her heel or something got hung up, and she and and, and her toes pressed against the the little step, and she kind of fell down, and it made and it bent bent her big toe kind of back at a, pretty bad, and. She, uh, I don't know, sprained. There, like the doctor said, there's there there is over a hundred little tiny bones underneath your big toe, and they all. And if you get that thing inflamed, and they get out of joint, and so you can't walk. And it took it took her months to be able to walk again. In the Old Testament, they cut off what the Old Testament, Old King James said, the great toes of the kings that they captured so that the kings couldn't run away. And so the big toe is the balance of the body. It's very vital. But let's just say you don't want to be a big toe because you don't like being a big toe because you're down there in a dark sock and nobody ever sees you and nobody admires you and no, no one looks at you like they look at the beautiful eye. You say, God, I know you made me a big toe, but I want to be an eye. And God says, well, I made you a big toe. Well, God, I'm not, I don't want to be a big toe, and I, I'm going to be an eye, and, 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 and you may have made me that, but big toe, but I'm going to be an eye. You know what God's going to say to you? He's going to say, well, go ahead and be an eye. But all you're going to ever see is the end of a sock <laughs> because I made you a big toe. And God is going to evaluate us at this Bema judgment, which just think of Bema as being a rewards, like uh, an Olympic judgment. You got a 10 point, you got a 9.9, you got a 9.8. It's not a judgment of whether you're lost or saved. It's a judgment of how well you did with what he gave you to do with. I'm always reminded of this when, when, I, when I talk about this, uh, about the, the father who had twin boys. And the twin boys were born and when they were born, it was obvious that one of the twins had had some, some, some damage in his brain when he was born, and he wasn't developing like the, like the other son, the other twin. And so as they, as they developed along, the older boy, or, or not the older, the, the, the boy who, who was whole, he was brilliant. He was just smart and capable and just just excelled in everything. And the younger boy did not fully develop totally with his, with his abilities and his, because of his brain that had been damaged. And one day the boys came home with their report cards and the, the, the brilliant one ran in to the father who was sitting at his desk and he began to show him his report card. And he looked at it and he said, son, I'm, daddy's so proud of you. You've done so well. You are so smart. And you've made straight A's. And I, boy, daddy's so proud of you. And then just about the time he's bragging on his brilliant son, he feels something um, tugging at his feet. And he looks down and he sees his, his, his little son who hasn't fully developed and his little son is untying his shoelaces. And then he's tying them back again. And he looks at his father 
And he says, Daddy, you know what I learned to do in school today? I learned how to tie your shoelaces today. And you know what you would do if that was you? You would, put, you would reach down there and put your arms around him and hug him up and say, Son, Daddy is so proud of you because you have learned how to tie Daddy's shoes today. Now, you may be a shoe tire in the kingdom of God, but if you'll be a good shoe tire, God will reward you for what he gave you to work with. Your management, what you do with what God's given you is what will be judged at the judgment seat. The reward from it, from the judgment seat, is that the whole theme of our lives and our ministries are that one day we will have an opportunity to lay down at the feet of Jesus something that the, that the judgment seat, the fire of the judgment seat, couldn't burn up. And I know in our human carnal mind that we still have, that we wrestle with all the time, it's, it's almost impossible to think that one day what's really gonna be important and what you're gonna want more than anything is not what you get to keep and not what you get to manifest in your own life and, and your own wealth and your own service. It's going to be, what do I have to lay at the feet of the one who gave everything for me. And the judgment seat is going to test those things in our life that we've done. And if it's gold, silver, and precious stone, it's going to endure the fire and it's going to produce a reward that we can lay at the feet of Jesus. If our lives are wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be burned up at the judgment seat and we're not going to have anything to lay at the feet of Jesus. So what would be gold, silver, and precious stone? Well, it would be those things that we do for the Lord that aren't improper motives, that aren't improper methods, that aren't those things that we do for ourselves. I, I, let me give you an example of one. And, and I've mentioned this and I... I was looking through a folder the other day. This is one thing about when you start moving things around in an office and so forth, you find things that you didn't remember that you had and you, you hadn't seen in a long time. Well, I found a folder and in this folder, it, on the outside of the folder, it said children art. And inside this folder were things that all through the ministry, children have drawn for me or written for me and gave it to me. And I put it in this folder called children's art so that I could go back and look at it from time to time. Now I'm gonna tell you, there were some really, really interesting things in there. All kinds of stuff. Pictures of me preaching and something and them sitting on the front row. There was one in particular that I was looking for and I, I can't believe that I, I couldn't find it in the folder, but this is one that was given, and I think about this one every time I think about gold, silver, and precious stone. It was a little nine-year-old girl that used to sit on the front row of a very small church that I pastored in Clark County, Mississippi. There were probably 30 people there maybe on a good day. And this little girl, her family didn't come to church her mom and dad didn't come to church. Her dad was an alcoholic and her mom was um, basically a single mom. And for some reason, we never could reach them to get them in. But they had two daughters. This one was the oldest. Her name was Tracy. And she had a sister named April that was about a five-year-old. And, and, and Tracy would sit right about to my right on the front pew and we had bulletins because we were a Baptist church and, uh, you know, have program everything, you know, get up, go to the bathroom. All right, here we go. Got an asterisk by it. But she sat on the front row and she would, she would sometimes would draw on a bulletin 
And one day she drew on the bulletin and when the service was all over, she came up to me and she said, Pastor Keith, I made this for you. And she gave it to me. And it looked like, when I looked at it, it looked like, like King Kong on the top of a building reaching down, you know, like to do something with some little stick figure down here that had a little drawing like that. So I guess it was a girl. And, and written beside that, it said, well, let me tell you this first. I, when I looked at the King Kong, I said, who is that, baby? She said, Brother Keith, that's you. I, I said, oh, okay. So, and then I looked at what was written beside it, and it said, thank you for telling me about Jesus. Now, that piece of paper is more precious to me than a Norman Rockwell painting. You know why? Because that will go through the judgment fire. That is gold, silver, and precious stones. And so our motivation for what we do in life is that whatever we do, it must, it must endure the fiery judgment seat of God, of Christ, if it's going to be a blessing in our life. And he has a reward from that for us. So if you say, pastors, what, what, what's important in life? What, 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 is, uh, what is it that we should focus on doing? Well, having the right motive, that it's not motivated to make me look good and to be all about me and to promote me and to do good things for me so that somebody will notice me. Uh, bad motive. And the way we do things has to be lawful, has to be right, not shabby and, 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 and iffy and uh, on the edge of, of being illegal and unrighteous and not right and, and, uh, and, and unlawful in life. And then whatever God's given us to do with, do everything you can with what he's given you to do with. And don't worry about what God's given somebody else. Somebody else might shine brighter than you. Well, it's because they've been given a bigger watt bulb. You know, I mean, you, you just shine the light that God's given you to shine, and you're going to go through the fiery judgment and receive a crown. The Bible talks about five crowns that we receive, and I won't go through all that, but we'll lay them one day at the feet of Jesus, and that'll be what matters to us most of all. We want to please the Lord. We want the Lord to be proud of our life. Be a good shoe tire in the kingdom of God. Be that big toe. You know, hang in there. You're valuable to God. All right, let's bow our heads.